What's up, folks? Welcome back to Tactical Tortoise. My name is Trevi, and it's time for another best list in Warhammer 40k. Face cam is off today because it is uh, very hot in my apartment right now, and I'm a little sweatball, so that would not be amazing to look at. But it is an exciting week because the time is almost on us for the new data slate. A data slate has been confirmed to be arriving on Thursday, so we just have a couple days left to talk about this current metagame that is dominated by Eldari, and hopefully we will see a shift within the next one to two weeks once those rules changes come into play. As always, what we're gonna be doing today is talking about the GT Plus level events that happened this weekend, talking about some of the winners and the factions that had players undefeated. And let's dive in by talking about the perennial masters of 10th edition so far, those are Eldar. And we are, as a little bit of a send off to the faction's dominance, gonna talk about an Eldar list this week from the Nova Open, although we should be be clear that Eldar did win the vast majority of events this week. They were undefeated at the TNA Open, the Goonhammer Open, where they took four of the top five spaces, the Clan Wars Scottish Open, the EA Slam, where they took both number one and number two spots, and Games of Westeros. 15. The list that we're going to be talking about today is Zach Point's list, aka Prospero. If you watch the T5S2 series, you'll actually have watched a lot of Prospero's games. He was in the most recent T5S2 Season 7 Invitational, where he made it all the way to the Grand Finals, unfortunately going down to Disappointing Salad in an extremely close finals game that you can watch on this channel if you want to go check out the VOD. Zach is an incredibly prolific tabletop simulator player and plays in tons of events over on the T5S2 Discord, so I do want to give a shout out to him for taking those skills in person and taking down the Nova Open. Now, this isn't the first big win that Zach has had. He has a lot of huge tournament victories under his belt, but obviously this one is enormous. The Nova Open was a 325 player super major held in Washington, DC, and playing Eldari, Zach was one of five out of the top eight Eldari players that made it there. Now, he wasn't the only undefeated Eldari player at the event. The Nova Open does use a little bit of a strange format for its final placing and positioning. Just like US Open events, that the Nova Open was actually the originator of the bracket mechanic, whereby players after the fourth round of the event for the final four rounds are actually bracketed and locked into a set of 16 players that they will compete against exclusively. There is no opportunity to move above your station within your bracket, even if you win all of your subsequent games. That can create some potentially weird results, especially for players who lock into a high bracket but then don't play all of their additional games, so they are guaranteed a space within that 16-person grouping, but they can never get any higher or drop any lower. So all that being said, Matt Shookman was also undefeated within the number one bracket, but I'm not 100% sure what the final placement metrics were because he did uh, get a significantly lower placing than Zach. That said, Zach's list was a significant departure from the normal Wraith Knight fair that we have seen on the tabletop, both from other LRA players, but also Zach himself. He was playing a Yanari army. So this was an Eldari battle host attachment, but used Yvrain as the warlord, unlocking the use of Drukari units who would then enter the army and gain the benefits of the detachment rule. This list included a Death Jester with Fate's Messenger to turn some of its dice rolls to sixes, Illic Knight Spear in a big unit of Rangers, the Incarn, as well as Yvrain. We had three individual Hornets with double Bright Lances each. That Ranger unit, just five of them, but a good spot for Illic, and with his bonus to wound these guys are excellent at sniping out characters and extremely difficult to engage with since Illic makes them untargetable. We also have three units of five Shadow Spectres, good for both anti-tank and anti-infantry shooting, so an incredibly good, well-rounded unit. One Viper, three Warwalkers with Bright Lances, three units of Warp Spiders, as well as three Ravagers coming from those Drukhari allies. The Ravagers add some extremely crucial anti-tank shooting to the army. Its utility units are not only fast and maneuverable with those three Shadow Spectres and three Warp Spiders, but they also give the army a lot of answers to infantry, so all of the vehicles can focus very heavily on anti-tank shooting. So it creates an extremely well-rounded army that's difficult to engage into. It scores secondaries extremely well, having so many fast independent units, and the Incarn can feed off of the death of all of these units by teleporting around the table when anyone is destroyed. Super cool list to see Wraith Knights not taking down the weekend's biggest event, and we are seeing a little bit more 
innovation out of this list. It is going to be interesting to see what Eldar have up their sleeves once these changes come through that will most probably nerf the faction significantly. Now let's move on to talk about some more interesting factions and the next highest placing faction this weekend was actually Chaos Space Marines who put two undefeated players into the top of their respected events. Those include the Tabletop Republic Presents Eternal Wrath GT. This was a relatively small 24 player event held in England and the Grand Onslaught 6. That's the one we're gonna talk about, which was won by Alec Huffman. This was a 46 player GT held in Seminole, Florida. Now, one of the cool things that we've seen from Chaos Space Marines recently has been an incredible breadth to the faction. They're able to play a shooting focused gun line using Obliterators and Forge Fiends. They're able to play a more aggressive infantry focused list using a Cursed Cultist, and they're also able to play more elite oriented builds that use their fast and incredibly hard hitting infantry. And that's what we're seeing today. This list issues a lot of the expensive characters like Abaddon that you would normally see, and also doesn't take any demonic allies, instead focusing on just four infantry characters, a Chaos Lord, Cypher, a Master of Executions with the Mark of Slanesh, and a Master of Possession with the Liber Hereticus. These guys are going to wombo combo together with two big units of Chosen that the list is constructed around. It does have three units of Nurgle Chaos Bikers to act as utility units. These guys are incredibly useful for their ability to pull off the table and then enter back in via Strategic Reserve, which makes them very good at scoring secondaries off the table edges. We then have a unit of four Obliterators to add some shooting and heavy fire support. And then the PS de Resistance for the list, two Nurgle Land Raiders that Nurgle unlocking the full potential of Dark Obscure Duration, allowing them to be potentially unshootable, both of which are carrying units of 10 chosen. Now, one of these chosen units has Mark of Slanesh. The other one has the Mark of Chaos Undivided. That Slanesh unit is most likely going to be attached to the Master of Possessions, which then contributes his own undivided mark to the unit. He himself has the Liber Hereticus, which allows you to get both sustained hits and lethal hits when you use your Dark Pacts. The benefit here is that because he's attaching to a Slanesh unit, and that Slanesh unit is getting at least the sustained hits benefit, which it is obviously if it's getting both benefits, it's going to then trigger its melee criticals on fives. So that allows this unit to go in, use the Chaos Undivided Stratagem, since it is an undivided unit, full reroll all of its hit and wound rolls, and then on five plus to hit, get both a hit that's then going to move to the wound roll and reroll from the Stratagem, but also an automatic wound from lethal hits. You're going to lethal hit the original hit and then generate a new sustained that you're going to roll to wound with. So this guy allows this unit to do potentially significantly more wounds than it started with attacks. An absolutely lethal combo. We then have two units that can attach to the second chosen unit, the Master of Executions and the Chaos Lord. That Master of Executions has a lieutenant style of effect where if you have another character attached to a unit, you can also add the Master of Executions in, who is a good character killer by himself. He has a Devastating Wounds Precision Axe, as well as the ability to grant his unit rerolls if they are attacking units that are below starting or half strength. That's pretty easy for these chosen units, which are able to advance and operate normally so they can go in, shoot a couple plasma weapons or bolters to try to knock a couple models out of the target unit, turn on that Master of Executions rerolls, and then charge in. With both chosen units dumping out of transports, shooting and then charging, both of which have access to rerolls either from the Master of Executions or the Chaos Undivided Stratagem, these two units are ridiculously difficult to kill. And getting the benefit of having two already tough land raiders that are potentially unshootable thanks to Dark Obscuration, they are extremely difficult to prevent getting up in your face. Behind that, we have those Obliterators, Cypher and Chaos Bikers performing actions and getting secondaries, and that creates a very aggressive but also well-rounded list that can play a wide variety of game plans. Super duper cool list coming out of Chaos Space Marines, one of the most unique ones that we've seen out of the faction so far. And congratulations on taking down a big GT to Alec Huffman. Now, we also saw some other factions undefeated this week, including Necrons, which won a 62-player major, the Road to Atlanta in Lombardio, Italy. This was won by Marco Santopadre, who played a relatively standard double Lich Guard variety of Necrons. This included the full holster of Hexmark Destroyers, three of them, one of them caddying the Sovereign Coronal, two Overlords, one of them with a Hyper Material Ablator to make his unit a little bit more survivable, two Technomancers, as well as a Transcendent Catan with the Sempaternal Weave. The unit was supported by a Canoptic Reanimator, included a couple of Scarab Swarms to 
act as utility units, two units of Crypt of Thralls to attach it to two Lich Guard units, as well as a trio of Doomsday Arcs to get buffed by that Sovereign Coronal, get plus one to hit, and act as fire support. We then just have the two standard Hyperphase Sword and Dispersion Shield Lich Guard units that are going to make almost unstoppable bulwarks in the middle of the table and be extremely difficult for their opponent to interact with. Pretty standard stuff from Necrons. I would be interested to see if this faction also gets a little bit of an update in the data slate as well, because they have been putting up some pretty decent results. Certainly not as good as Eldari or some of the other factions in the top, but they are extremely strong. Moving on to other strong factions, we also have Imperial Knights, which took down the Straight Edge Wargaming's Malmo Game Week GT. This was won by Bjorn Eriksson, who took a very Armager and Imperial Agent-focused Noble Lance. This was led by Canis Rex, as well as a Knight Crusader with Mythic Hero to pass its Bondsman ability out to two separate Armagers, allowing two Armagers plus the Crusader itself to benefit from plus one to hit. The Armagers that were targetable were either two Armager Helverins, which to be honest, were probably the ones being targeted most of the time by the Knight Crusader or three Armager Warglaves. Holding down the back line, we also had a Kalidus Assassin, Inquisitor Kotiaz, who is not only a pretty solid Inquisitor by himself, but is also pretty good at melee. He's got a solid brace of attacks and for only 75 points is kind of a steal. He's able to attach into one of the two Inquisitorial Henchmen squads. The larger one that Kotiaz was jumping into included a demon host and a gun servitor, but we also had a bare bones four man unit just with their normal allotment of melee weapons and firearms. A little bit different than the normal exaction squads that we see in the back line here, but seeing Kotiaz being able to join into these enhancement squads is Super duper cool. Moving on, Thousand Sons have returned to the undefeated table with the Midcon GT. This was a 59 player GT held in Vyborg, Denmark and was won by Peter Herbill. Peter played what is quickly becoming a very common construction of Thousand Sons that focused extremely heavily on their exalted sorcerer characters. This list included Aramon on a disc of Zinch as well as two exalted sorcerers on discs of Zinch. We then had an Arcane Vortex Infernal Master to add his damage output alongside two standard Thousand Sun Sorcerers, one of them with the Lord of Forbidden Lore to allow multi-casting of rituals, and one of them with the Umbralific Crystal to teleport his unit around the table. We of course took Magnus the Red because he's an absolute Chad, alongside two units of 10 Rubric Marines with Soul Reaper Cannons and Warp Flamers, and three units of five Rubric Marines with Warp Flamers as well. Those two large units could attach into Rhinos, and we also had a couple allies as well, two lone operative characters from Chaos Demons, the Blue Scribes and the Changeling, a pretty standard demon allotment. It's interesting that we have seen such a transition from the more long-range shooting-oriented Thousand Suns builds that focused on Scarab Occult Terminators and potentially some vehicles to these extremely close combat-focused armies that are composed entirely of flamer-equipped rubric marines. These guys are good at killing both infantry with just mass flamer attacks and heavier vehicles because of all of the benefits that you could potentially be granting them. You can remove opponent's saves, give them plus one to wound with Aramon, and obviously supplement their damage output with the flamers and devastating wounds from these sorcerers themselves. With the two Exalted Sorcerers on discs, they are both able to trigger their half movement abilities on individual enemy units, and then with the Lord of Forbidden Lore potentially be double moved back into the safety of their Rhino transports, making the army extremely difficult to advance onto as well. If your opponent is focused on melee damage output, you can potentially flamer away their front line, slow down their back line, and do that a couple times until your opponent's army is dead. And if your opponent's playing defensively, you can play very aggressively yourself by double or even triple moving your flamer squads or using the Umbralific Crystal to teleport them around the table to potentially get alpha or beta strikes on players that are trying to hide in their deployment zone. This list is incredibly flexible. It's another faction that we should keep an eye on seeing any changes in the new data slate update. And with the massive number of characters, sorcerers, and special abilities in play, it also looks very fun, but very finesse oriented to play. Now, last but certainly not least, we also had a showing from Space Marines this week with the Iberian Open, uh, a 32 player GT from Lagrano, Spain. This one was won by Kajolin Waif, who ran Death Watch in their characteristic Black Spear Task Force. This was led by only a single captain with the Tome of the Exoclades, allowing for once per game double oaths of moment effect, but not running any Watchmasters whatsoever. So leaving their additional Vect CP tax off the table and their ability to advance and operate normally with Death Watch veteran squads. Speaking of which, we had two of those, each of them running four Thunderhammers and four Frag Cannons, alongside a big 10 
10-man Desolation Squad. These guys have incredible synergy with the special ammunition types that Death Watch are able to load into their ranged weapons, either extending the range of their weapons, giving them assault, or improving their AP. We also had a Hell Blaster Squad, which is also good for similar reasons. One Inceptor Squad for some utility, two Infiltrator Squads, alongside one Land Speeder, which is able to spot for the Frag Cannons Blast Weapons, giving them plus one to hit and naturally ignoring cover, which is super useful. A big Proteus Kill Team, which was kitted for close range fire, including two additional Frag Cannons, two Death Watch Thunder Hammers, a couple Terminators with a mix of Thunder Hammers, Power Fists, and Cyclone Missile Launchers, plus a bunch of allies to hold down the backline, including two Exaction Squads and a Kalidus Assassin. This is pretty similar to a lot of other Death Watch builds that we've been seeing creep up lately. It is interesting that we haven't necessarily been seeing them put up too many undefeated results, but with the flexibility of both their Teleportarium stratagem, allowing them to pull Death Watch veteran units into Deep Strike on their opponent's turn and then jump them around the table to get maximum use out of those frag cannons, plus having a pretty effective Desolation Squad, not quite as good as an Ultramarine Gladius Task Force, but very similar with the ability to buff them with those special ammunitions and a lot of mid range shooting from the Hell Blasters and Inceptors as well. This is an extremely well-rounded list and it has a good matchup into a wide variety of opponents. And that's it. Those are all of the undefeated lists in Warhammer 40k for this week. Tons of Eldari still, but we do see some of the other factions making a show, and it's going to be fascinating to see how the meta shakes out once Eldari are hopefully removed from their pedestal and some of these other factions are able to come up and take their place. We also have have the interesting dynamic of the Tyranid Codex being added to the environment. So we're going to see a ton of brand new armies popping out of the woodwork and establishing their dominance. The next couple of weeks or so are going to be a super exciting and interesting time for the 40k metagame. So definitely let me know down in the comment section who you think is going to come out ahead. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel to watch future installments of the best list in 40k. And with that, thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video. Big thanks to everybody who supports the channel, either over on Patreon at patreon.com slash tactical tortoise, YouTube channel members and Twitch subscribers. All you people are great. And I love you. You. Remember to keep it classy, folks, and have happy wargaming.